Hey guys and welcome. Just waiting for Jesse to join in. AKA the glucose goddess. <laughs> She'll be joining in any moment. Cool. Thank you for joining, Jono. Hello, hello, hello. Cool. How's the sound on your end? Good. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I have a tiny bit of uh, feedback, actually. Uh, what about... What about me? Hello, hello. Still feedback. Feedback, okay. Um, maybe with your Zoom, did you want to maybe... Yeah, let me try to swap that. Hold on. How's the sound now? Thanks for joining, Daria. Hello. Thanks for joining. Cool. Michaela, thanks for joining. Cool. Alrighty. I think the sound's pretty good on my end. Perfect. I can All hear right. you too. Okay. Alrighty, welcome everyone to yet another episode of the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today I'm joined in with Jessie, also known as the Glucose Goddess, and in <laughs> fact, probably one of the very first profiles to really be uh, monitoring and tracking blood sugar with a CGM device. And I remember coming across her profile and I was, you know, captivated by some of the data and some of the things that she was tracking and I was, you know, really caught my interest. And I know even in the last, you know, three to four months, your, your page in general just really taken off, which is amazing. So, um, Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lucas. And I just want to say, you know, you were one of the first people to follow and support me like back maybe, okay, not that long ago, maybe like a year ago. <laughs> I remember getting a message from you and I probably had, you know, 3000 followers back then. And you were like, Jesse, I love your page. I can't wait to see your account grow. And already then, you know, having 3000 followers was way beyond anything I had ever imagined. <laughs> and now looking back, it was really just the beginning. So thank you for your support from the beginning. It means a lot. Yeah, no worries. Um... So do you want to maybe like give my listeners a bit of a, a background into how you got into like, I guess, the CGM space? Totally. Um, it's kind of an interesting circuitous um, route. So I would say my journey into health started when I was 19. I was on vacation with some friends in Hawaii and we went to the jungle and we thought, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea to jump off this waterfall? And I said, yes, for sure. So I jump off the waterfall, but in midair, I sort of freak out and I forget I need to land with my legs really straight. So I land on my tailbone and the pressure from the water creates this shock wave in my spine and explodes one of my vertebrae. So I broke my back in this waterfall doing something fun with my friends. And from then on, I'll spare you the details, but it was just a lot of like physical rehab after I had a really intense surgery. And then a lot of mental health issues came up for me. I was very confused about life. I really wanted to understand my body and how to take care of it. And at that very young age, I realized so incredibly deeply that health is the most important thing we have, you know, without physical and mental health, you just, you have nothing. And to be 19 and to go from very naive teenager to knowing this very intimately and very deeply just set me up for this path of working in the health space and trying to reconnect with my body. So anyway, then I went to school to study biochemistry. Then I worked in a genetics startup for four years and I ended up testing a glucose monitor maybe two and a half years ago, sort of randomly. And when I put this little device on that shows me the levels of my glucose within my body every five minutes, it just clicked for me. I was like, my God, this is the most useful and incredibly insightful device I've ever worn. Now, every time I eat something within minutes, I get feedback from the inside of my body, which was like the holy grail for me. I wanted to talk with the inside of my body. So I get feedback from within. I mean, this is crazy. I get feedback from within on my phone regarding whether my body essentially liked or didn't like what I just ate. And it just fascinated me. I thought, 
wow, it's amazing. All of a sudden, I don't have to listen to opinions anymore about how to eat or what to do to be healthy. I can get data straight from under my skin constantly and figure out how to optimize what I'm doing to feel and be as healthy as I can. So that's, yeah. that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating really now that we have like the, um, the tools as bio, like we're, we're truly biohacking. That's like we're, what we're doing. I think it's, I think it's um, a bit of a, a gift that we have that sort of technology. And now that we can, yeah. you know, having that, that autonomy and that we feel empowered now that we have the data so we can use it and run experiments on ourselves. And I'm sure you've done many yourself, like with um, certain foods and you posted your data and stuff like that. So do you want to maybe talk about, I guess, some of the, um, some things that really shocked, shocked you? Like when you were <laughs> yeah. um, sure. So when I first started putting a glucose monitor on, I was a little bit confused. So for example, if I had, you know, nachos on Monday, I would see a big glucose spike afterwards in my bloodstream. And then if I had the same nachos on Sunday, my glucose would be completely steady. So, and I would see this with a lot of different foods. I would see that depending on when I ate them, the response would, would vary significantly. And at the beginning, I was just, I was just taken aback by that. It was a little bit weird to understand. And then I realized it's not just about what you eat a lot of things influence how your body responds to carbohydrates. And it can be how much you just exercised, how well you slept the night before, what you currently have in your stomach, uh, in which order you ate the food on your plate. So I would say I would, there's a, there was a big lump of just confusion and awe when I realized it's not just about the exact thing you're eating. It's about everything else going on. So that was one thing. And then maybe to date, my most um, surprising and a little bit annoying experiment um, was when I did with my ex-boyfriend. So I love cookies. Like I love chocolate chip cookies and I grew up eating them. So when I eat cookies, of course, cookies have a lot of starch and they have a lot of sugar. So that starch and that sugar, as you digest it and it goes through your system, it ends up in your blood and it spikes your glucose really high. And you want to avoid these really high spikes, right? So I eat the cookies, big spike. My ex-boyfriend was also wearing a glucose monitor. And when he ate the cookies, dude, I kid you not, just the flattest curve ever. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something going on today. We redid the experiment three times. And every time for him, the response was completely flat. And for me, it was like, Pow, Pow. so individual differences are a real thing. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of science out there that's trying to figure out why do we respond differently to the same food? And it has to do with just your physiological state, maybe your microbiome, maybe your genetics. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's a really surprising thing that I found. For me, cookies are not a good option, but for him, they're a good option if he wants to eat something sweet. Yeah. So maybe for the listeners, um, let's sort of talk about some of the symptoms that you might experience when you're in either like a a hyperglycemic or a hypoglycemic yeah state. like when i um let's say three hours after a super high carb meal let's, let's say i've had like massive bowl of white rice with some veggies and like a few hours later i might notice that dip and for me the symptoms are like a bit of brain fog um maybe a little bit of blurry vision mm -hmm. uh, or fatigued what are the symptoms like for you like do you experience that when you experience I do for sure. Uh, for me, the, the biggest and most difficult to deal with symptom is if I'm fasting, so I'm super hungry and I haven't eaten for a while, then I eat something high in sugar. And as my glucose levels are spiking up, I just feel like it's, it feels like a migraine. It feels like really intense brain fog for me. And for years, I didn't know what that was. And I was just like, whoa, I really don't feel well. I felt a little bit disconnected from reality. I was like, what's happening? Uh, and now I know that it's when my glucose is just shooting through the roof that my brain, it's almost like it's an altered state of consciousness, not a nice one. <laughs> you just, I just feel like shit. Um, so for me, the yeah, for me, the hyper is really uh, disagreeable. It's not nice at all. And then as my glucose comes back down after a big spike, I experience some of the usual stuff like feeling hungry, having cravings for sweet things um, and feeling tired. Yeah. So do you notice um, in terms of like certain meals and things like that, do you get 
Do you notice any, because I know a lot, a lot of listeners will be curious to know like how protein, let's say mm. a lean of chicken or, or red meat or fish, like does that have any, obviously it contains no glucose, but does it still mm. have a you know, spike on blood sugar? That's a really good question. So yes, proteins don't contain any carbohydrates per se. So technically, you know, nothing that should turn into glucose. However, when you eat large amounts of protein, some of it gets converted to glucose. And this is especially true if you're like on a ketogenic diet. That's why it's really important when you're doing keto to make sure that you're not eating too much protein because otherwise some of it will be converted to glucose. Um, but generally, like protein in and of itself, even if it converts to glucose at a small rate, will still do so way less than any carb you could ever eat. Yeah. 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 What's your experience with that? Uh, well, I've only, I've only ever had access to like a regular, um, you know, like a pricker, a finger pricker, mm -hmm. singular glucose monitoring yeah. device. I wish I had access to a CGM. I'd, be, I'd literally be wearing it every day and just doing experiments all the time with certain supplements. And um, even I, I'm not, I know there's been a few times where I've encouraged you to test out like cinnamon and apple cider vinegar and things like yeah. that. Yeah been playing around with a few like um they're called like glucose disposal agents so things that can um basically like bitter melon cinnamon and other hmm. things that can help to increase like peripheral insulin sensitivity and things like that so um yeah in terms of like my own experiments i think just like yeah if i eat a really high carbohydrate meal on its own without any fiber fats or protein then i do notice um, a dip a cup, for me it comes like two hours later I notice that dip um, but there are so many factors like you mentioned in terms of things that affect that response so like post workout it's a different story if I have yes. yeah like if you're going to train super hard and then post workout I can tolerate like a super high carb meal fine no, no dramas um, I have to tell you a story. Yesterday, I did something incredible. And right now, unfortunately, my phone is filming, so I can't show you on my phone. But um, I think I did the most successful pasta eating <laughs> a moment in my life. So I love pasta and I love eating like massive bowls of it. And yesterday, I think I did the perfect sequencing so that the pasta didn't spike my glucose at all. So I had a bowl with two soft boiled eggs and some cabbage. Okay. And then half an hour later, I had this massive bowl of pasta. So first of all, making sure that you eat fiber and protein before you eat carbs really helps reduce the glucose spike. But then about 45 minutes after eating the pasta, I got on my bike and I did 30 minutes of super intense, you know, interval training. And Lucas, my glucose was completely flat. Like the pasta didn't even register. I was so happy. <laughs> yeah, there, there have been some studies where they compared, um, you know, 15 minutes of post-meal walking. Mm. Uh, that three sessions of like three by 15 minute post-meal walks is equally, if not more effective than the anti-diabetic drug metformin, which is um, pretty amazing. And I actually got myself a... Um, a walking treadmill desk. I but saw. It's been, it's literally been the best thing I ever got. Cause like, really? Um, yeah. I just feel like it's in terms of keeping that stability and like, um, like there's so many other benefits to just walking mm -hmm. and getting the steps in from like a, a creativity point of view, mood and beating mm -hmm. it out. So yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely encourage people to do that post meal. If you're going to have a cheat, meal, let's say you have a cheat meal, mm -hmm. like what, what can you do to offset it? Well, that's one thing, you know, exercise. I agree. And also, you know, it's, of course, carbohydrates themselves, it's not about, particularly for, you know, my followers, it's not about cutting out all carbs and just going on a super intense keto diet. But when you're going to have carbs, there are things that you can do to make sure they don't affect you that badly. And one of the main things you can do is actually, you know, use your muscles afterwards or before so that your body, as it gets this massive dump of sugar in the bloodstream, it sends the sugar to your muscles that need it to work out instead of just letting it, you know, float around in your blood and potentially cause harmful side effects. So exercise is such an incredible tool. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. talk about some other little hacks that we can implement such as I know you did 
I think you've done a couple of posts on apple cider vinegar. Oh yeah. I should be sponsored by uh, the Bragg's apple cider vinegar brand. Cause like the number of people who bought it. <laughs> so, um, there's no silver bullet in terms of how you can eat to feel better and be healthier. You know, it's, it's a daily, it's a daily process. And every day you have to make sure that you reduce the amount of sugar you eat and try to eat more balanced. However, apple cider vinegar in my experience and in the scientific literature appears to be the only silver bullet, maybe with exercise actually. So apple cider vinegar is this like magical thing that, if you have just a tablespoon of it, you know, in, in a glass of water uh, before you have a meal will significantly reduce the speed at which the sugar in the meal will get dumped into your bloodstream. So it'll completely flatten any potential glucose curve from what you just ate. Um, and it's amazing. And it works every time. And it works instantly. So there's really no reason to not drink apple cider vinegar. The taste is a little weird, but personally, I just feel like it's acquired and then you get used to it. And now I just crave it even outside of meals. Um, and the way it works is really interesting. Um, they think, well, scientists think that when you eat apple cider vinegar, it reduces the space or the, the sort of the width of the hole between your stomach and your intestine, therefore slowing down the speed at which the food in your stomach passes through your gut and goes into your blood. Have you tried it? Yeah, I've experimented with apple cider vinegar a few times. Um, and I was looking into the actual, like, I'm trying to understand, like, what, how does it exert such a potent effect on dropping the blood sugar? And I was trying to investigate some of the mechanisms. And what I noticed was actually that uh, it shared a lot of the same mechanisms as, like, bitter melon as cinnamon and it actually um yeah it does delay that glucose release um but another like a different pathway to stabilize that blood sugar is actually to inhibit the absorption in the small intestine so it's inhibiting that enzyme alpha glucose interesting um which is yeah and that's like a, a typical mechanism and even if you look at like uh, metformin which is the anti-diabetic drug it actually shares a similar effect as well, which is quite interesting. Wow. Interesting. I'll have to look into that. That's really cool. And you know, you mentioned cinnamon and what I, what I've seen in the studies is that cinnamon works if it's taken over time, yeah. you have to sort of build it up in your system. So if you just say, Oh, I'm going to have a piece of chocolate. Let me sprinkle some cinnamon on that. <laughs> it's not going to change anything. You have to be diligently taking it for weeks, I believe until it has an effect. Whereas apple cider vinegar just works the first time, you know? Yeah. You know a Actually, lot about cinnamon. Tell us a bit more. About cinnamon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what they, I just did a post today on cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of its uh, mechanism, there's actually one metabolite, um, the sodium benzoate. And they actually believe that, um, or is there sound distortion? I think it might be. Can you hear me? Clearly? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, in terms of the, the cinnamon, yeah, like there's a metabolite, that sodium benzoate, which actually they believe interacts with the microbiome to alter some of the gut bacteria. And if you have a look again, if you look at some of the adaptogenic herbs, a lot of them actually increase the growth of Akkermansia. And Akkermansia mm. is actually a very pro-longevity, pro-metabolic health. And in fact, you can even take Akkermansia to support, they're doing studies on exogenous achamansia as a bacteria to um, improve metabolic health, which I find really cool. Um, but actually one thing I wanted to discuss was um, biotin. Are you familiar with biotin? Vitamin B7? No. Well, actually in some studies, um, they use really high dose of biotin, like 10 to 15 milligrams in type one diabetics. And in fact, it, significantly reduce their requirements for insulin really so, yeah yeah yeah. And i'd be i'd be curious to see like just in general with yourself like um just get, getting some regular biotin and just doing some experiments with like really high dose it's it's, it's definitely safe like i've seen studies it's fine <laughs> please only tell me to do safe stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fine you won't grow okay okay Okay, well, send me the link and I'll get it and I'll test it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, um, the biotin. 
So what about, um, let's look at some of the other factors that have really wrecked your sugar sensitivity. Like what about mm. sleep? How has sleep impacted your glucose? That's a great question. Sleep and glucose levels have this sort of a symbiotic relationship. So when I go to bed with high glucose levels and my glucose curve is like a, sort of like a roller coaster through the, throughout the night, I sleep poorly. And then when I wake up and I've slept poorly inside of my body, the systems that are in charge of regulating my sugar levels, they're, you know, they're sleepy. They're like not doing very well. So after a poor night's sleep, if I eat something that's high in sugar, it's going to spike my glucose levels way more than if I had eaten it on after a really good night's sleep. So what I do to try and counteract this is if I ever wake up feeling super tired, the first thing I'll do in the morning is I'll go and work out. I mean, even like a 20 minute, you know, small interval training session will bring my glucose sensitivity back to where it's supposed to be so that during the day I don't start off with a big roller coaster and then more cravings and more spikes and more drops. Cause that's, that's the issue. You know, when you wake up and you feel poorly, I often want to reach for something sweet just cause I'm tired and that's what my brain is craving. But if I've slept poorly, that sweet thing is going to impact my body in a way worse way than if I had slept well. So it's going to start me off with a roller coaster, which will make me have a pretty bad day. So yeah, exercise is my, is um, my tool after a poor night's sleep. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, definitely. Like if I've had a, if I've had a, the first thing I'll do is I make sure that my first meal is very high protein. Yeah. Very, um, a little bit of veggies. And then I actually tend to carb backload. I've been, I've been, so I just run experiments on myself all the time. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a good candidate for this sort of stuff. Cause I'm literally just, there's so many variables all at once. I'm just experimenting. Yeah. But I have been I have been playing around with carb backloading, and I, what I do there, and I've been posting on my story that some days I hit like 450 grams of carbs, no issues. Um, and in that case, I actually I'll start to refeed the carbs after 2 p.m., like 2 or 3 p.m., and then cut off at like 8 o'clock. Mm. So there's two main meals that I get the majority of my carbs in. And I make sure that, like, all the way up until, like, 2 p.m., I mean, like, fat burning. Like, um, How do you get 450 grams of carbs? Like, what do you eat? Yeah, well... That's impressive. I, yeah, I, I split it up sometimes. Like, I'll do frequent meals after 2 p.m. So, I might do, like... I have... I do have quite a lot of muesli bars, um, mm. like, oat-based ones, because uh, I can digest them fine. I used to struggle, but now they're, they're fine. Um... And I think the fact that I'm on the treadmill, like I'm a, I, I can really easily shuttle it. Like I'm able to uptake it fine. It doesn't affect my, I don't get the, the, the slumps. Wow. Um, it's really cool. Like I'm, I'm literally working and walking at the same time. It's so easy. Um, so yeah, just, just doing those sort of experiments. Um, nice. Yeah. What about, I'm curious to know if you've ever tracked it after like a cold shower. If I got a what after a cold shower, sorry? Have you ever tracked your glucose after a cold shower? Um, no, I mean, most of my showers are a little cold, so I haven't specifically like looked into that, but I have seen that when I go in a sauna, my glucose levels shoot through the roof. And at the beginning, I was concerned. It turns out that it's just that the sensor doesn't deal with heat very well. <laughs> so, so I think the heat just kind of messes it up. So those values seem to not be real. But no, not after a cold shower. Why? Yeah, because I, I would have thought that based on um, you know, the initial hormonal response following a cold shower, mm. the body releases like norepinephrine and norepinephrine can stimulate mm. Like and adrenaline can stimulate glucose uh, glycogen breakdown, so mm. that might lead to a glucose spike. But it's interesting how you said that sauna use actually, um, you know, one of the mechanisms by which sauna is actually like beneficial is that it raises growth hormone, and now growth hormone is actually being known to, uh, I guess, um, dampen the the body's insulin sensitivity, which is um, quite interesting. Nice. Did she, did she go ask a question 
Uh, any other solutions apart from lifestyle Libre, which you had experience with? So the question is, any other sensors than the Freestyle Libre? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the sensor thing is kind of a hassle. Um, I use the Libre because it's the cheapest. It's also the prettiest. Uh, you know, science should be stylish. So, so um, unfortunately, in the US, you need a prescription for it. In Paris, where I get mine, you just can walk into a pharmacy and buy them. So this is the best solution I have found for now. But the hardware piece and finding a sensor that's affordable and easy to get without a prescription, we're just not there yet. It's yeah. really not great. We're going to have to wait. I'm actually, I'm in, I'm in talks with a company from the States, uh, Nutrisense.io. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah, but Vichy listening in, I'll, um, I'll link you that company later on. Um, oh, I, I, I'm familiar with them. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. We know each other. Yeah. So yeah, what do. they do is they, you know, they get your prescription and they ship you the sensors. Um, but it's not, it's not as easy as just walking into a pharmacy and buying them yourself. So there's a lot of cost that needs to be um, dealt with in order to get the prescription. So it's not yet super affordable, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesse, before you even started like with this, um, you know, monitoring your glucose, did you, did you have any like, I guess, um, any degree of like insulin resistance at all? No. I mean, no, I'm, I was super metabolically healthy. I guess the main issues that I would complain about were this brain fog that I didn't know. I didn't know where it came from. My skin wasn't great. I didn't understand how to have a good night's sleep. And I always felt guilty when I ate spaghetti or cookies because I didn't realize how to do it in a way that wasn't bad for me. So metabolically, I was fine, but I had other issues that I really wanted to... Um, to be able to solve. And I was just fascinated by this idea of being able to connect with my body and being able to speak with my body. You know, since my accident when I was 19, that's been my, my journey. My journey has been how can I possibly understand how this amazing machine works? You know, um, I sort of liken it to, okay, let's do this Nick. So Lucas, when was the last time you took a plane? Where'd you go? Jeez, last time I was on an airplane would have been to the Northern Territory, so up north of, of Australia. Okay, so when you walked into the plane, before you turned right, you know, you kind of maybe glanced um, at the cockpit. And I often do this, and when I look at the cockpit, I'm like, oh my God, buttons, levers, screens, that shit looks complicated. And I'm just happy that the pilots know what they're doing. And I walk away and go to my seat, right? The thing is, as a human, if you want to take the analogy, if the body is, if our body is the plane, you know, like this whole thing is the plane, we're not only the passenger in the back that's just hoping everything will go well, but we're also the pilot. Like we have to not only make decisions to figure out how to navigate this thing, but we also bear all of the consequences. So to me, this whole mystery of how my body works um, was almost put to rest when I heard about glucose and I understood glucose because I realized if I'm in the cockpit of my body, the most important lever I can understand is glucose because I can affect it instantly with everything I eat and do. And it literally has ramifications on every part of my physical and mental health. So to me, glucose was just like this very clear thing that I, that I heard about and learned about. And it became very obvious that it was super important to make sure I knew how it worked in order to navigate my body as best as possible. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, was there a, um, did you ever get tempted to want to measure your blood ketones at all? So I used to be keto, um, I would say four years ago, I really got into keto. And so I would do the sticks on which you pee, you know, but that was the only thing I did. Yeah. And for me, keto was really tough. Um, I, my period stopped. I just felt really strange. I just, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Yeah, I feel like it works better for men. I don't know if that's your experience as well. I've never, I've never undergone like strict keto. I don't think I ever will uh, personally. Yeah. Um, I need my carbs to feel good. Like it's just yeah. my, from like a hormonal perspective, from a training point of view. Like, yeah, if I cut back on the carbs. Then yeah, my whole my body goes to to shit. To be honest. So yeah, it, it is important. It is important, even from like a I mean, I get my thyroid checked frequently. I always do like 
the blood test for thyroid. Um, not that I have any issues with it, but I'm always trying to max it out. Like I'm always trying to get it as as optimal as possible. You're and such then, an optimizer. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's like in terms of like the, the glucose intake, that does affect, you know, that, that active form of thyroid, that T3. Um, and even body temperature as well. That's a really good marker. Um, I'm sure like a lot of people that are on keto would probably likely experience issues with thyroid and mm. general body temperature, inability to tolerate cold, but mm. so important. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. So what about um, from a, I know you would have had a lot of attention from a lot of like women struggling, I guess, with PCOS. So have you, have you had a look at the link there between like, you know, blood sugar stability and or regulation of PCOS? Yeah, I have. Um, and it's really interesting. So PCOS, from what I can glean from the studies, is a condition in which you have, you know, overactive or higher than normal levels of sex hormones in your body, which leads to a lot of symptoms. And when your blood sugar levels are too high and too deregulated, your body can't flush these sex hormones properly. And so one of the main things that I, I've noticed have been really effective in women to PCOS is to stabilize your blood sugar levels. Because by stabilizing your blood sugar levels, you stabilize your insulin levels. And that is really the key in helping your body flush these excess hormones as much as possible. So, I mean, every week I discover new conditions that are linked to glucose levels. It really seems like it's an incredibly important thing to do uh, for everything from, you know, acne to weight gain to PCOS to heart disease prevention. It's just like, it's really important. Yeah. And even to yeah. the particular, particular virus that's around the world right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just key. It really is. There's, there's no upside in having uh, high or variable sugar levels. It's just not yeah. beneficial at all. What about, I know you're I'm glad you brought that up. Um, have you ever personally measured your like fasting insulin at all? No, but I want to. And there's this cool company called Meterbolic, and they're working on a finger prick insulin test that you can do at home. So I'm definitely keen to try that out. How about you? Is that 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 sounds really cool? I'd love to. Yeah, I'll send you the link. Yeah, they're really cool. They're still really early. They're actually, I think, they're looking for uh, beta testers uh, in their first cohort. I'll send you all the info because it's really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I've I've checked my fasting insulin twice. Um, first time I was sitting at just five. So between, I think the most ideal range for like a healthy individual is like two to five. Okay. Um, so I was sitting on I was sitting on five. I don't really have any symptoms of like you know, insulin resistance or anything. I don't want to get too like orthorexic about it. Um, mm -hmm. But no, it's it's fine. But it's definitely a marker that I think a lot of people should be looking into if they have energy issues, like hormonal issues, um, brain fog, depression. Yeah. Body. And in fact, you know, glucose is not everything. And if we were able to measure insulin continuously instead of glucose, it would be way better, way better. Uh, because your glucose can be low, but your insulin can be high. And in fact, when you're developing a metabolic disorder, the first thing that starts increasing is insulin before your glucose starts increasing. So I just hope that uh, one day we'll have continuous insulin monitors because that would be the holy grail. That would be so much better. Yeah. CIM yeah. device. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's give our listeners some really practical tips that they can apply i guess like right now in terms of like just stabilizing blood sugar so do you want to give maybe like your top three tips sure yeah. absolutely okay tip number one never eat carbs naked so what i mean by that is that when you're having starches or sugars never eat them on their own always have them with a little bit of protein a little bit of fat or a little bit of fiber uh, anytime you can combine carbs with something else, you will reduce the speed at which the glucose in the carbs will hit your bloodstream. So example, um, if you're gonna have a piece of fruit or a cookie, add a few almonds before that fruit or that cookie. If you're gonna have a piece of bread, add a little bit of cheese to it or like a slice of avocado. 
right? So never have carbs naked. That's the number one tip. Second tip that's super easy and amazing is when you're having a meal or you're looking at something on your plate, always eat the carbs last. And it's kind of related to the concept I just mentioned. What you want to do is you want to avoid the carbs hitting your stomach first. You want to sort of like make a little bed of fiber and protein and fat in your stomach before the carbs come in. So on your plate, you know, if you have, I don't know, salad and some protein and some carbs, start with the salad, then the protein, and then the carbs. That'll really help reduce the spike. And studies have shown that just changing the order of the foods that you eat without changing the composition of the meal at all can reduce your glucose spikes by 30%. It's crazy. That's like metformin level stuff. It's amazing. And then the third one would be, I mean, it's probably my favorite. It's the apple cider vinegar trick. So buy a bottle of apple cider vinegar. Uh, my aunt did this really cute thing. She got this tiny little flask that's usually for alcohol. And she puts like three tablespoons of apple cider vinegar in it. And she carries it around with her all day. <laughs> so when you know you're going to have something high in carbs, put a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in a glass of water and just drink that before you have the carbs. That way you know that you're helping your body process the carbs in a better way. And you're sort of helping avoid this very, very bad side effect of eating a lot of sugar uh, by flattening the curve. Yeah, that's so good. They're, they're, all, they're all tips that I apply myself, like just intuitively or, you know, I just, I apply all of them. They're, they're really good. Totally. One of them, actually one I'd be curious to know more about is actually, I don't know if there's any research in, like conducted in, on like chewing, like chewing rate, like how many chews, you know, like cause a lot of people, tend to just waft their food down. I'd imagine that that was, huh. you know, the glucose. That's interesting. I'll have to look at that. But like, if we, if we think about it, if we take an extreme, you know, if you're having ice cream and if you gobble the whole ice cream scoop down in a second versus you spread it out over like six hours, obviously the six hour one is going to have a slower spike because the glucose is going to hit your body at a slow rate. So then if you compare like a five minute, eating to a 20 minute eating, I'm sure you see some of that same effect. So yeah, probably, I think we can, we can hypothesize um, that eating more slowly will help you curb a glucose spike from a meal. Yeah. Another thing that came to my mind was actually, I wonder if, cause I'm a huge fan of salt. I don't know about you, but I, I love my salts. Like I salt pretty much everything. Like I'm a salt thing. Um, but I'd be curious to know whether, cause I know Dr. James C. Nicola Antonio, he talks about how salts, incredibly important for like um you know generating stomach acid and reducing adrenaline and helping hmm. with insulin uptake and things like that so i'd be curious to know whether or not you know salt would have an, an effect on um you know, glucose um release or anything like that that's a good question i don't know we'd have to look into that hmm. So what do you do? What do you do with all the? Uh, I'd imagine you get a lot of DMs, a lot of messages asking for experiments and things like that. So how how do you go about? I guess like organizing and, and curating. Well, um, I make a list of all of the things. <laughs> I, I get a lot of yeah, I get a lot of DMs. I get a lot of requests, and they're, and they're amazing. And I hope people um, keep sending them to me. But I just organize them, and then. I just go with the most interesting one first and I just keep going. It's like an infinite amount of things to test. Um, often when people ask me, Hey, have you tested this? I can point them to an older test um, that is a little bit equivalent to their response. Or maybe there's a study I can show that says it doesn't work or um, yeah, I try to give people an answer. And if I don't have an answer right away about what a particular food would do to glucose, um, I try to test it as soon as possible, but it is hard. And the cool thing is I actually now, you know, it's not just me anymore. So there's a whole community of people who are testing foods, uh, wearing a glucose monitor and sharing uh, the results. So a lot of the posts that I post now, and it's incredible, are actually made by the community. So if you look at the descriptions, you know, I'll say this post was done by a keto tester, by Frida, you know. Um, so there's more and more people doing it. And I really just want my profile to be a place where we can assemble all this information and give it to people so the more people join in the better the community is always growing and i'm so excited about it it's really cool yeah it is it is it's really fun it's like when i first found your profile and i was like looking at the graphics they're just really they're fun to look at and observe and, um, and 
sure like it's really had a profound effect on just people's awareness I guess like you're really just that's what you're doing you're doing a really good job at that thank you helping people understand their, their biology a lot better which is you know it's really important it's fundamental to as we've already mentioned you know metabolic health and disease immune health depression anxiety um, hormonal health it's really good Thanks, Lucas. Well, yeah, it's been amazing. And I'm super thrilled to be able to share this knowledge. And, you know, I'm not inventing anything. Like, I'm just using, I'm just illustrating the science that already exists. And I just think it's such an important topic. And I'm so thrilled that people are interested. And I want to keep going. You know, I want everybody in the world to know about this and understand that with the food they eat, they can have a profound impact on how they feel. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be extreme. It's just about learning a few things about how your glucose levels work. Yeah. Mm. Has your um, your light, your screen, my phone, might have somebody just commented on My screen, what? Uh, it's just gone dark. Like, yeah, I don't know why. I thought that was you who did that. <laughs> Weird. Is that better? There we go. It was a lighting thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So we've got some really practical tips for our um, listeners. Maybe even. Um, have you thought about maybe like offering a like a voting a voting system where like you, can, oh. you know um, poll people and ask them what they want to see? You. Look, that's what I'm saying. Like you send me a request, maybe yeah, setting up like a poll system. That's a really good idea. Yeah, currently what I do is sometimes I just post a story asking people for what test they want to see next. But the voting thing is super brilliant. Yeah, I could totally do that. I like that idea a lot. Like an upvote. You could upvote and downvote particular tests. Yeah. Great idea. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think that's pretty much, we've gotten through most of what I wanted to cover. I really wanted to, yeah, the focus I wanted to um, spend our time on was the understanding the differences in how you feel during a hypo glycine episode versus like a hyper state. Because I know a lot of those, there's a lot of um, crossover in terms of symptoms you know, yeah. state. but I definitely think yeah, our listeners have um, you know, learnt a lot and they're going to they're gonna continue learning through your experiments and um, all the stuff that you're doing which is really really awesome thanks for your support Lucas it's so amazing I really appreciate it yeah um, alrighty so um, Jesse if for those who want to like learn more about you do you have any other like platforms that you're on I know you've done um, Twitter, anywhere else? No, you know, Instagram is really the place. Um, I mean, if people want to know more about like me as a person, I, I mean, they can message me. I, I'm not that interesting. Like, I think, I think the content and what I share is really what's important. Um, I share all my posts to a Facebook page, but it doesn't, it, I really haven't done anything with it. So Instagram is the place right now. Instagram, and I'm really excited to be doing more and more podcasts. Um, so yeah, just look out for podcasts um, and then stay on the Instagram. And lots of exciting things are coming soon and they'll all be based. They'll all be announced on the Instagram. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, thanks thanks for joining in, Jesse. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> Bye.